Savvy Central Radio, drawing out the best from our guest with your host, Christina Nitchman. Join our mailing list today by texting Savvy Radio to find out about upcoming guests and events and receive a free gift how podcasting can help increase sales and influence in your business. This is your host, Christina Nitchman. Each week, Savvy runs weekly broadcasts providing entrepreneurs and successful individuals a platform to express their dreams, hopes, lessons learned, expertise, and wisdom with the world. Our guest today is Kevin Crane, U.S. former special agent with the Federal Investigative Services under the Office of Personal Management. Today, Kevin joins us to share details on his new book called Access Granted and the benefits of gaining a government clearance and how to protect your business on and offline. To find out more about Kevin and his new book, Access Granted, go to his website at federalsecurityclearance.net. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. How are you this evening? I'm doing great, Christina. How are you tonight? I'm doing fabulous. I'm excited to have you out sharing your new book, Access Granted. You have a very interesting background and career. You started your career way back in in security, and you worked as a U.S. special agent with the Defense Investigative Services, which later became Defense Security Services. But I'm really curious to find out what caused you to break out on your own and, and write this book, Access Granted. Well, as you know, I'm retired, and uh, I was a federal agent for 21 years. Uh, eight of those years, uh, I was a supervisor, and I wanted to write a book for about 10 years and finally decided to sit down and do it. Uh, mm-hmm. My goal is to use my book as a platform for speaking and training engagements for young people, such as college students. Mm-hmm. I've always enjoyed working with youth, uh, especially as a coach and referee during my 38 years of karate training. And both my book and speaking interests will allow me to continue helping young people. Mm, That's great. And um, as I mentioned to you prior to the interview, most of our listeners happen to be women, 70%, 30% men listening in. But they're in the 40 to 50 year range. And a lot of them have kids going off to college and they're deciding what they want to do with their life. They're not quite sure on why getting a security clearance might be beneficial to their future. What do you hope people gain from reading your book most? Well, I think the people who have the the most to gain would be high school students, college students, or really just about anybody who would like to work in a career that requires some type of a background investigation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many people think that it's just people that work for the government or military that require a background investigation. And although that's true, uh, they all will have their backgrounds checked at some level. There's so many other career fields that require a background investigation. Uh, For example, teachers law enforcement, uh, career in finance, and many information technology careers will also require a background investigation. Yeah, I totally see that. In my background experience, which was in finance, I worked for Moody's Investors, which is one of the biggest financial agencies in the world, and they had an extensive background check. For anyone who's now getting ready to either look for work or anything in government, or maybe not, like I was looking in finance, What should they be prepared for when getting an investigation done on them? What do they need to pay attention to or know about before they get started? Good question. Mm -hmm. Uh, So many high school and college graduates interview for jobs that will require some type of a background investigation in order to get the job, uh, such as you did with Moody's. Mm -hmm. Uh, This may be just a criminal record check, such as with the state police and FBI. But if you fail the background check, uh, the job is going to go to somebody that can actually pass it. Mm -hmm. So my strategy is to train people how to strategically place themselves in a favorable position way before they ever go for a job interview so that they increase their chances of getting hired for any job when they do go and interview. So basically, if you fail to plan, you're Mm -hmm. planning to fail, as the saying goes, Mm -hmm. and oftentimes it's just too late to fix any background issues just prior to or after your job interview. And now if you're not going for something, say, high security, and it's not government related, but it is a security background, what are something that could get in the way of you getting a job like that you could be denied? Uh, It could be actually any number of things. Uh, I do cover pretty much all the issues in my book, but let me give you some examples. Um, For instance, recent or current use of illegal drugs to include the sale, purchase, distribution, manufacture, trafficking of illegal drugs. Um, any recent or current problems related to alcohol use, 
Mm -hmm. uh, any serious arrests that are fairly current or even frequent minor arrests that show a disregard for the law. And here's a gold nugget for you, and you'll mm -hmm. appreciate this one. The number one main reason for people being denied security clearances mm -hmm. is due to having financial problems. Wow. This could be This could be anything from, you know, just being irresponsible and not paying your bills uh, and anything up to and including a bankruptcy. Uh, of course, uh, these are only some examples of why you might be denied a security clearance or a job uh, mm -hmm. that might possibly require a background investigation that, you know, they cover those types of issues. But in my book, I do list all of the issues that the U.S. government will look at when they decide to grant or deny a security clearance. And you can apply my strategies and tips on fixing your issues, even if the job of your choice requires a simple background investigation. Mm. That, that's very telling. I hadn't known about the financial past. That if I'm going for an interview and they're asking you about your background and say you've had some difficulties, whether you got a DWI at one point or you had some financial difficulties, you don't exactly want to present that at your interview. You want to come across in your best possible light. And I recall many years back, I was going for a jeweler and they want to make sure people were financially responsible because you're going to be working with diamonds and very high priced goods. And they asked you on the specific application, had you ever had any problems or had to restructuring of financing? Yes. And uh, they asked questions like that. And then they said to each person in the room, is everything that you wrote on your application valid and true? I'm giving you one last option before we put it through. And I thought that was a little odd at the time. But now hearing what you're saying, I can see what why that's important. Because they were giving you a chance to fess up and say, before we put this through for investigation... Let us know now, is there anything we don't know? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Really good for people to pay attention to. Now, in your book, you also mentioned that gaining government security clearances would benefit and create opportunities for individuals both financially and with regards to their independence. Explain how that works. Well, uh, actually, there's a, a number of ways that that can actually help you. And uh, mm -hmm. what I did was I made sure I had a couple of notes here to pass on. Um, in fact, if you go to my website, and I know that you have, but if your listeners go to federalsecurityclearance.net, that's my website, I actually allow you to read chapter one of my book for free. And uh, what I discuss is that the research has shown that people who have a security clearance uh, typically earn 5000 to $15,000 more annually than those that don't. And uh, here are some examples I wrote down uh, of career and financial advantages of having a security clearance. Uh, one. Uh, a security clearance uh, provides you with the ability to get trained in classified skills, uh, mm -hmm. i.e., you might get a confidential, secret, or top secret clearance and have access to that type of material. Uh, these valuable skills can help you obtain other jobs if you choose to move on. Uh, number two, your security clearance can be transferred to other careers that require security clearances. Uh, for instance, a cleared uh, person in the military uh, can easily transfer and quickly uh, their security clearance to a federal job. So you go from the military to the federal government or possibly a private industrial company such as a Boeing, uh, Martin Lockheed, etc. Uh, the third thing I have is the ability to transfer your clearance makes you more of a valued person to hire since the employer doesn't need to wait months or perhaps a year or longer for you to get your clearance. So you can basically start work immediately where somebody that doesn't have a clearance can't. So you're very valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, there's bonuses in the private sector that are given to people that have a security clearance because they can start uh, much more quickly. Uh, and the last thing I have, I put a, a worst case scenario, if you will. If you're mm -hmm. denied a security clearance or can't pass any type of a background investigation in general, it really forces you to have to take a job that doesn't require a background investigation. But unfortunately, those jobs usually pay much less. Um, how many college grads uh, do you know that are forced to take jobs at malls, bars, restaurants, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Not that that's a bad thing, but th they can't afford to repay their student loans as a result. So my job is to help students achieve success by getting the career they want and worked hard for. 
Wow, I can totally see, and I, by reading your book, I totally saw the financial benefit, how much less you would get paid if you didn't work on having the proper information before walking into an interview and, and getting an investigation done. And I was a little perplexed about how it would play a part in you increasing your independence. Would it allow you to move up the structured ladder and get greater jobs more quickly? I mean, how would it work out in, in your independence as a career goes? Well, that's, a, that's a, a good question. I guess the simple way to explain that for your listeners, um, as in any entry-level position, if you will, if you're graduating uh, from college, for instance, and you get a federal job or maybe enter the military, you start off at uh, the bottom level, if you will. But in order to even get those positions uh, that are highly coveted, uh, you need to pass a background investigation to get a security clearance. Mm -hmm. Once you get it, you then sort of move up the ranks, if you will, by gaining experience, um, putting in your years of service, all the time having access to classified information. Again, you might be cleared at the confidential, the secret, or perhaps the top secret level. Mm -hmm. And uh, by getting that uh, training experience, uh, what we call in the government knowledge, skills, and abilities, mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to eventually earn more money by just uh, getting increases in your pay grade, getting promotions, uh, just moving up the career ladder, if you will. Mm. And definitely, you don't want to stay at one position for the rest of your life. You want to continue no. to grow and flourish. No, exactly. Now, when it comes to security clearances, they're not all equal. A government security clearance has a variety of different levels. What are some things that could impede someone from receiving government clearance? And also, what could they do to if they are prevented or impeded? How could they look to reverse or counter response? Well, what they could do, actually, uh, several things. Um, if we look at this based on the various issues, uh, mm -hmm. What I would tell people, depending on the issue that's occurred or the seriousness of the issue, uh, almost any issue that you have can be fixed. Uh, there's going to be a person called an adjudicator for the federal government that's going to review your investigation once it's completed. Uh, they look at what's called the whole person concept. Uh, that would be all the good and all the bad. And they also look at what's called mitigating circumstances. That's a good phrase to remember, mitigating circumstances. But simply put, um, a mitigating circumstance would be described as a reasonable or a plausible explanation as to why something happened. And I could give you some examples using, using these mitigating circumstances. Right. Uh, in this one, uh, a young man or a young woman applies for a job that requires a security clearance or maybe a background investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were, say, a teenager between, we'll say, 15 or 16, they experimented with marijuana. Not unusual. Uh, the report of investigation will outline the dates they used the marijuana because they're going to be asked uh, how often they used it, did they ever purchase it, the mm -hmm. last time they used it, and if they have future intentions of using marijuana again in the future. Uh, if the adjudicator reads, hypothetically, that the person only used it less than 10 times uh, due to peer pressure, experimentation, um, hasn't used it for the last couple of years, hasn't been involved with any other type of drug involvement and has no future plans uh, on ever being involved with illegal drugs in the future, uh, mm -hmm. these answers will be the mitigating circumstances that will more likely than not allow the adjudicator to award you a security clearance. So you can substitute marijuana use with just pretty much any issue. And I do have another golden nugget for your listeners. Mm. Uh, in my book, I list really all of the issues uh, and the mitigating circumstances that are reviewed by the government adjudicators. So mm -hmm. to get back to uh, what can be done if you have an issue in your background, mm -hmm. I provide the answers in my book that are accepted by the government. So uh, instead of researching it on the internet, it's really at your fingertips uh, if you have any type of issue and really what to do to provide, you know, avoid these issues to begin with. Yeah, avoid it. And then there is any issues. There's a, a clear and cut way that you can start to resolve it by going to your book and reading up on it at federalsecurityclearance.net. Correct. Yes. Awesome. Now, there was something that I found also very interesting that would work very well for all of our listeners, whether they're a high school, college person, or if they themselves are older and running a business. And that is, what are some tips that you can give our audience who, to protect themselves online from cyber attacks and such? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because it's such a slippery slope. I was recently interviewed on um, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox 
uh, regarding the Chinese hacking into the government computer system. So it doesn't get much bigger than that. And uh, it was a problem. Uh, but uh, for businesses that were hacked into, such as uh, Primera Blue Cross and Anthem, those are medical insurance companies, uh, businesses such as Home Depot, Staples and Kmart, uh, the list goes on and on. I do have some tips that I can provide. Um, one, it would be uh, don't store more customer data than you need. So if you have customers and you're storing their data, there's really no reason to keep credit card numbers and other sensitive customer information just to have it on file. Uh, make it a policy to purge your customer records from your system once that data is no longer relevant. So if it's not there and you do get hacked, uh, they can't get it. Uh, the second tip I have is to put the right technologies in place. Uh, first and foremost, make sure you have a firewall protecting your network. Make sure you require strong passwords, not just yourself, but all your hopefully one day employees if you're opening a business yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, just keep those things strong. Don't make it easy for the hackers to get in. Uh, the third thing I have is to train your employees to thwart the tax. Uh, many breaches, uh, including the target breach, um, occurred because the employees unintentionally and unknowingly handed over sensitive business information to a hacker uh, who had presented themselves as a reputable person in need of information. So you have to be trained in that. And the last thing I have, because the list can go on and on, if you can hire a reputable information technology security company to check out your business computer system, they may not be able to stop a professional hacker 100% of the time because nobody can, uh, but they can make uh, sure that at least you don't make it easy for that hacker. Hmm. Those were really great tips. And I remember way back uh, a couple of years ago, I was working, I think someone in my company uh, was working and, and that's why a lot of companies actually really try to stop employees from playing around the internet, but someone was playing around, I believe, on Facebook, and they uh, contracted a, a worm virus of some sort, and it, it brought down the entire company. So I can see here that being careful on where you click and what you're clicking is one type of making sure that you don't compromise your security. And the password thing, I've heard so many times that often people's passwords are your birthday or sometimes a word password, pretty easy to crack. And, and also, it recalls for me a business I heard about, AV business a number of years ago that went out of business. It was an online business that provided a number of services for aviators and their in entire system was hacked and destroyed and they didn't have any backups to um, bring their systems back online. They, they pretty much went to a very basic site that was like starting from ground one. Well, it's, it's a problem. It's, I mean, even when you look at what happened recently with the Office of Personnel Management, mm -hmm. when the, we believe the Chinese hacked into the government database, uh, they didn't have the most updated uh, software or computer system. Uh, therefore, they weren't able to have the best possible protection, such as uh, Homeland Security uses. It's a system called Einstein. Mm -hmm. The government spends $356 million annually on it, but there's roughly 51 different uh, government agencies that can't even use it because their systems are antiquated and they can't use this type of uh, updated software. So, we're really behind the eight ball uh, as a government. Hopefully mm -hmm. this will open up some eyes. And uh, But there's no reason that uh, the average everyday person mm -hmm. uh, such as us and your listeners can't do things to protect ourselves. And, and you need to be very proactive. Yeah. Now, that's interesting for me. How does updating the software play into protecting you? I, I never knew about that. Well, there's different types of uh, antivirus software that mm -hmm. can be provided. In the case of the federal government, uh, Homeland Security, the FBI, national security agencies, uh, their computer systems are very much up to date and they can actually uh, utilize the most advanced uh, encrypted type software to protect from hackers such as what happened to OPM. Mm. But if you don't have an updated system, uh, they can actually maintain uh, updated uh, type antivirus software, uh, you're just inviting trouble. And the government the office of o OPM, they knew that uh, this was an issue and nothing was done about it. I'm sure there's a lot of red tape, but uh, mm -hmm. as a result of what happened, uh, they could have spent perhaps millions of dollars to update the system. And now we've actually probably lost billions of dollars worth of uh, very sensitive information. Mm, that's very telling. Well, at least for our small business owners, there's definitely a 
uh, lower price option for them to get started. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> they won't have to spend <laughs> billions or millions. No, no, not at all. Yeah. And also, you mentioned the password thing. What would you suggest for someone deciding on a password to use that would be a strong password? Well, I, uh, certainly, as you were mentioning, you know, you don't use <laughs> anything that's going to be familiar to people. Uh, dates of birth, uh, uh, people's names. Uh, it's almost laughable just to say that, yeah. but to use a password that has a, a mixture of uh, not just letters, but numbers and other symbols. And maybe even more important, Christina, would be to actually change that password at least monthly. Mm -hmm. uh, this way, you're not going to make it easy for somebody to hack into your system. And uh, if you're concerned about your uh, finances and protecting them, uh, then get a company that does just that, such as a LifeLock. Mm -hmm. I know I've used it um, for almost seven or eight years. I even have it on my two-year-old twins and my seven-month-old son uh, only because they have social security numbers. And if you have a social security number, uh, you're prone to, if you're hacked, mm -hmm. have somebody open up an account that uh, you may never become aware of until you start getting bills. Mm -hmm. So LifeLock, basically, they just check out your name and make sure no one is using it but you. I mean, how does they how do they work? Well, typically what will happen is um, if someone should go to apply for a credit card or open up some type of an account, maybe for a telephone or something, cell phone, uh, you'll get a, a notice that uh, an account is being opened and they might send you a text. They could send you a phone call or an email, depending on how you choose to set it up. Mm -hmm. And then you'll call LifeLock and you'll either verify that, yes, this is me doing this, or I did not authorize that. Uh, and at that point, uh, you'll ask them to freeze your account mm -hmm. so that uh, it doesn't go any further. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just one example of how LifeLock can help you. So I've had that happen before and uh, I know that it works. Yeah. And actually, I, I've found for myself that credit cards and banks have been a lot more careful with client accounts by, you know, if they see something that looks a bit out of the ordinary or unusual, they put a freeze on the account. And a number of years ago, I went for coffee and my TD Bank account was frozen. And so I got a cup of coffee and my debit card didn't work. And I was like, wait, I just got my, my paycheck today. What do you mean my debit card doesn't work? But can be inconvenient at times, but I'm so grateful that credit cards and banks are being careful. And all it takes is a quick phone call to your bank or your, your credit card to say, hey, that is me. It's okay. You can release. Uh, absolutely. It's better to be a little bit inconvenienced by having to mm -hmm. have your card uh, not accepted and make the phone call to clear it up uh, as opposed to being notified that your bank account has been wiped clean. Yeah. And, and at that point, they actually told me that someone tried to use my debit card number in England and buy $4,000 worth of suits. So I was very happy they denied that particular transaction as well as my coffee. <laughs> no, no, that, that happened to me. I got a yeah. phone call where somebody in Taiwan was trying to purchase $5,000 worth of television sets. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to know if I authorized it. And of course, I didn't. Yeah. So uh, you really need some sort of a system. If it's not LifeLock, mm -hmm. you know, you can get one through some other company. But uh, that's been my experience. And it's been very good. Absolutely. Well, for anyone who wants to work with you, find out more about you, is there anything else you'd like to let people know about your business and what's coming up for you in the near future? Sure, absolutely. Uh, again, that, that <laughs> website is federalsecurityclearance.net, federalsecurityclearance.net. Don't put .com because <laughs> you won't get me. But uh, I would advise people, uh, if I could at least give a, a last piece of advice, mm -hmm. uh, get my book. It, it's only 99 cents for Kindle. Um, I think it's fifteen ninety five for the paperback version. All the proceeds from the first year of my sale are going to the Wounded Warrior Project, so I'm giving mm -hmm. back to my country. Uh, but read the book twice. You get more from it if you read it twice. I would also say at my website, if you go to my press media page, mm -hmm. watch the TV news videos that I've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, between doing both of those things, you'll have done at least the first steps to help you be more proactive in taking control and steering your life in the right career path. So that would be my final words of advice. That's fabulous. Well, I want to thank you again, Kevin, for coming out here and sharing all your advice and wisdom. Thank you very much for coming to Savvy Central Radio. Thank you, Christina. Join our mailing list today by texting Savvy Radio to find out about upcoming guests and events and receive a free gift, how podcasting can help increase sales and influence in your business. 
Savvy Central Radio is home to over 100,000 listeners per month globally and runs in syndication on eight AM and FM platforms, including iHeartRadio and six podcasting platforms. To find out more about our paid sponsorship opportunities or to become a guest and find out how we can help you get your message out to the world, call 718 area code 713-2289 or email at SavvyCentralRadio at gmail.com.